Good morning, fellow market enthusiasts. In today's video, we're gonna be talking about intermarket analysis. Now, intermarket analysis is one of my favorite subjects because much like sector rotations, it's gonna help us to gain a deeper understanding of the important relationships in the financial markets. Specifically in this video, we're gonna be talking about the historical correlations between the major asset classes, commodities, stocks, bonds, and currencies. What we'll find is that each of the major asset classes shares a historical relationship relationship with the others. And those relationships, for the most part, are driven by fundamental reasons. When we track and monitor the relative performance of the major asset classes, it helps us to not only determine which phase of the business cycle we might be in, but also the key drivers of the financial markets at any given time. And once we've identified those central themes driving the financial markets, we're better prepared to position our portfolio in a way that represents our current market outlook. So gauging the relative performance of the major major asset classes is step one in our top-down approach. It's the very top level view of what's driving the financial markets. And the more that we can internalize the relationships between these major asset classes and then measure where they are at a given point in time, the better we are prepared to risk manage our portfolios and to forecast what's likely to happen in the future in both the economy and the stock market. Without further ado, let's jump in and learn a little bit more about intermarket analysis. So again, intermarket analysis is just the study of the relationships between the financial markets. Specifically in this video, we're gonna be talking about the relationships between the four major asset classes, stocks, bonds, commodities, and the US dollar. That said, understand that there are thousands of relationships in the market, some of which are quite valuable to track and monitor. So while we're only looking at the four major asset classes today, the tools and techniques that we're gonna be using in this video are very much applicable to any market relationship. So what's important to know is that each of the major asset classes influences the others. Now, some of those influences, some of those relationships are stronger and more reliable historically, while others are more intermittent. So what we're gonna be doing is measuring the historical correlation of each of the asset classes, measuring the strength of those correlations currently, and measuring the performance of those asset classes in relation to one another. This is going to clue us into the central themes driving the market. It's going to help us to understand where funds are flowing, which asset classes are showing the most favor, and how to create high probability investment opportunities based on those central movements. It's gonna help us allocate our portfolios appropriately and to make smarter investment decisions. So first up, let's talk about one of the strongest, most reliable relationships, that of the US dollar and commodities. The US dollar and commodities share a historically inverse correlation, meaning that they tend to trend in opposite directions of each other. And this has to do with some fundamental factors. The most influential of which is the fact that most commodities are priced in US dollars. So when the dollar weakens, when the dollar declines and is worth less relative to other currencies, the effect is that it ends up requiring more US dollars to purchase those commodities. And that boosts the price of those commodities, which again are priced in US dollars. Conversely, when the US dollar declines, it makes it cheaper for holders of foreign currencies to purchase those same commodities. This boosts demand for commodities from holders of foreign currencies, which is the majority of the world. And this once again provides another tailwind for commodities prices. Commodities like oil, steel, aluminum, copper, etc. all stand to benefit from a declining US dollar. Now that we have a better idea about the mechanisms by which the US dollar and commodities are correlated, let's hop into the market barometer and let's measure that historical correlation and let's see how they're positioned relative to one another at this moment in time. So I'll go ahead and set this up for you guys so you can kind of see how it's done. Um, first of all, we'll pull up the dollar. UUP, that's the Invesco DB US dollar index. We're gonna use that as a proxy for the price of the dollar. Uh, in addition to that, I'm going to add this chart overlay. I'm going to add symbol, and we're going to look at DBC, which is the Commodities ETF. 
DBC tracks a basket of commodities, focusing on energy, agriculture, uh, precious metals, industrial metals, so on and so forth. So it gives us a good proxy for broad-based commodities prices. So right away, it's fairly evident the inverse correlation between these two asset classes. I mean, you can see as the dollar trends down, this major downtrend here, you have an inverse uptrend here in commodities prices. And I'm just giving you guys rough trend lines here. So while in the short term, the strength of this relationship can vary, the long-term trends are generally in the opposite direction of one another. And when you do see these two trending in the same direction, it's usually a warning sign that one of them is about to turn in the opposite direction. So getting a deeper understanding of the themes that are driving the price of these asset classes can really help you to determine which way these things are going to break. For example, right now it's December 2020. We're about eight months after the coronavirus pandemic fallout. And you can see that this relationship is especially pronounced throughout this time. As fiscal and monetary stimulus has begun to weaken and devalue the dollar, commodities prices have entered a new uptrend in light of that. So right now we're basically looking at 2020 year to date. But if we look back further in time, we can see that this relationship really maintains a pretty strong inverse correlation. In fact, I'm going to change these from daily bars to weekly bars so we can get a clearer picture of the long term relationship between these two asset classes. So again, we see that this, you know, historical negative correlation really holds up, but that's not to say that they never trend in the same direction. So one more tool that I want to show you guys before we move on is the correlation coefficient indicator, because this can help us to measure the strength of that relationship at a given point in time. Now, I don't really want to dive too deep into the math behind this, but it's a handy way to judge the strength of the relationship between various assets. So in this case, we're obviously looking at the relationship between the dollar and commodities. But in general, a correlation coefficient of one means that two assets are perfectly correlated, meaning when one moves up a dollar, the other moves up a dollar. A correlation of zero means that there's no measurable relationship influence that these two assets have on one another. A correlation coefficient of negative one would be a perfect negative correlation, meaning that when one moves up a dollar, you can expect the other one to move down exactly a dollar. So typically a correlation coefficient above 0.8 or below negative 0.8 is considered significant. So right away, you can see that historically the relationship between the dollar and commodities is resoundingly negative. But that's not to say that the strength of that relationship doesn't ebb and flow. In fact, sometimes they're positively correlated. So it's a good idea whenever you're performing intermarket analysis like this to keep in mind the current strength of the relationship. So going Going back to daily bars here and we'll take a closer look at kind of the current setup of this relationship. You can see that over the last several months, it's been significantly negative. So their historical relationship is holding up pretty strong right now with a current reading of negative 0.86 as far as their correlation coefficient is concerned. So that inverse relationship is strong and statistically significant right now. Also notable about what we're seeing here is March of 2020. That was the depths of the coronavirus pandemic fallout. And you can see that the correlation between these two asset classes became very positive at that time. So if you've ever heard that in a falling market, all correlations go to one, this is what they're talking about. So while the dollar and commodities in general share a historically negative correlation, whenever there's a ton of volatility in the market, relationships tend to break down. So don't think that just because you have negative correlations on your side that you're necessarily protected from highly volatile events like those that we experienced around the coronavirus pandemic fallout. So next up, we have the relationship between bond prices and commodities. Now again, just like the relationship between the US dollar and commodities, the relationship between bond prices and commodities is also negatively correlated. The fundamental mechanism as to why these two asset classes are negatively correlated has to do with interest rates and inflation. You see, commodities can kind of be used as a proxy for inflation. And again, that has to do with the declining value of the dollar, right? So, so when the dollar declines, it requires more dollars to purchase things. In this example, commodities, right? So rising commodities prices can be used as a proxy for inflation. Now, when inflation picks up, the Federal Reserve is inclined to raise 
interest rates to curb that inflation. Now, bond yields, which are a factor of prevailing interest rates, are negatively correlated with bond prices. So accelerating inflation tends to lead to higher prevailing interest rates, which leads to higher bond yields, which drives bond prices lower. So that's the main fundamental factor driving the relationship between these two assets. But keep in mind that there are other factors that drive the prices of these two assets independently of one another. So while there's a central mechanism that drives the relationship between these two asset classes, be aware that there are other influential factors just like any of the other relationships in the market that also drive the prices of these things independent of one another. With that in mind, it's once again important to measure the current strength of the relationship between these two asset classes before making any decisions decisions based on this relationship. So once again, let's jump over into the market barometer to get a closer look at the current strength of this relationship. So once again, we're using DBC, the uh, Invesco DB Commodity Index ETF as a proxy for commodities prices. And in the top chart there, we're looking at TLT, which is the iShares 20 plus year treasury bond ETF. That's going to be our proxy for bond prices. So as with the US dollar and commodities, we see that this relationship is resoundingly negatively correlated. But this one is not quite as strong historically as the relationship between the dollar and commodities. Um, you can see that it's typically negatively correlated, but it doesn't reach down below that negative 0.8 level of significance as often and as consistently as the relationship between the dollar and commodities does. And in fact, at this very moment, the relationship between these two assets isn't significant at all with a current reading of about negative 0.5. So I don't really use this relationship as much as far as making investment decisions. But what's important about this relationship and what's going to help you as a trader is to understand that in inflationary environments, interest rates are more likely to rise. That's going to typically have the effect of increasing bond yields. It's going to push bond prices lower. And being able to understand that narrative, I think is highly valuable as far as forming that macro opinion and understanding what's driving the markets. In fact, if you incorporate everything that we've talked about so far, you can really start to see how these things play play out over time. For example, if we had a declining dollar, we would expect that commodities would be on the rise. With the commodities rising, that is a proxy for increased inflation. With increased inflation, the Federal Reserve becomes more and more likely to raise prevailing interest rates in order to curb that inflation. With raised interest rates comes more attractive bond yields. And with higher bond yields, we have lower bond prices. So while these relationships rarely develop that neatly, that uniformly and sequentially over time, understanding that narrative, that idealized narrative, helps you understand what deviations from that narrative may imply. Next up, we have the relationship between the US dollar and stocks. Again, these two asset classes share a negative correlation, although this one is even less reliable as far as you know remaining negatively correlated and one influencing the other. But there is a fundamental mechanism as to why a declining US dollar is typically good for the stock market and vice versa. This once again goes back to the relationship between the US dollar and foreign currencies. So when the dollar is weakening, foreign currencies become more valuable relative to the US dollar. So US goods become more attractive to holders of foreign currencies. This creates increased demand for US goods and services and has the effect of increasing US exports. Many of the US based publicly traded companies do business internationally. So whenever you know US based goods and services are more attractive to holders of foreign currencies, it provides a boost in demand for the goods and services of those companies, increases US exports, and provides a tailwind for US based companies doing business internationally. Now, this relationship tends to be stronger and more reliable in the early innings of a new bull market, the early expansionary phase of the business cycle. But later in the expansionary phase, as inflation starts to creep in, once again, the Fed is inclined to raise interest rates, and higher interest rates are typically a negative for the stock market. So, this relationship tends to break down as inflation inflation creeps in and is highly dependent on the current state of inflation and the interest rate environment. So while this relationship is also important as part of our macro narrative, understand that there are other influential factors at play that are affecting this relationship. So let's hop back into the market barometer real quick and take a look at the historical correlation between these two assets. So once again, in the topmost chart, we have UUP, our dollar proxy. And in the bottom chart, I've loaded up SPY, which is the uh, S&P 500 ETF. 
we'll use that as our proxy for the stock market. Right away, you can tell that you know the correlation between these two asset classes is not nearly as strong and reliable as some of the others. But once again, it's another important piece of our narrative. Looking at the year 2019, you can see that on the surface level, it looks like these two asset classes are fairly correlated, positively that is, with both of them moving up. But looking at the correlation coefficient during that time, you can see that there wasn't much correlation between these two assets at all. So that indicates to me that there were other factors at play that were moving both of these asset classes higher at the same time, independently of their influence on one another. But then we come to March 2020 at the uh, you know coronavirus fallout, and you can see that the historical negative correlation between these two assets really resumes at that point. And that's being confirmed by the correlation coefficient, you know, spending more time below the negative 0.8 significance level. And that to me is kind of an indication of a turning tide as far as the macroeconomic narrative. I mean, if you think about what happened around March and, you know, since then, uh, there's been a ton of fiscal and monetary stimulus here in the United States. That's had the effect of devaluing the dollar. At the same time, a lot of those funds have been pumped into the financial markets. So it's turned stocks higher as the dollar has sold off. So, you know, that whole narrative really being encompassed in the chart that we're seeing here. So lastly, let's talk about the relationship between stocks and bond prices. Now, this relationship is typically defined by a positive correlation, although this has flip-flopped back and forth at different points throughout history. But once again, the fundamental mechanism driving the relationship between these two asset classes is an important piece of our macroeconomic narrative. That mechanism has mostly to do with interest rates. So whenever interest rates are high, it typically has a depressing effect on the stock market. Also, higher interest rates lead to higher bond yields, which lower bond prices. So higher interest rates are typically a negative for both the stock market and for bond prices. And that's kind of the fundamental explanation as to the you know, positively correlated relationship between these two asset classes. Although in certain market conditions, stocks and bonds may be competing for the same investing dollars, in which case they have something of a negative correlation. So the relationship between these two asset classes is much less reliable and tends to go back and forth depending on the prevailing market conditions. But once again, there are a ton of other factors that drive the price of the stock market and bond prices independently of this relationship. So we're gonna focus less on the strength of relationship between these two asset classes and mostly consider this relationship in light of the mechanism that tends to lead them in the same direction, interest rates. So why not just use interest rates to forecast what's gonna happen next with each of these asset classes? Well, you can and you should, but the thing about the stock market in particular is that it's a leading indicator. So not only is it gonna price in what is happening and what has happened in the past, but it's also gonna price in investors' expectations about what's gonna happen next. So the stock market tends to lead changes in the macroeconomic data. So I like to look at it from this perspective because it provides us a way to look at investors' expectations and what's likely to happen next and how the market is positioning itself in light of what it thinks is gonna happen next. So all of a sudden we're talking about investor behavior and a lot of other things that can't necessarily be explained in real time by macroeconomic data, which is typically lagging in nature. So when we look at interest rates, interest rates are usually reactionary to things that have already happened in the past. Whereas stock market prices are not only looking at what's happened in the past, they're also looking at current data and they're a reflection of investors' expectations about what's gonna happen next. So stock market prices are generally forward looking. That's not to say that the market is always right and that investors collectively always know what's gonna happen next. But when we look at stock market prices, it gives us a glimpse into investors' expectations about what's gonna happen next, and then we can evaluate whether we agree with that market consensus or not. So when we evaluate the stock market and we evaluate all the relationships that we've talked about so far, you can get a really good understanding of what the market's collective thinking is about the way forward. So when you find that you disagree with what the stock market is pricing in moving forward and you're right, man, that's when you're gonna find some of the most favorable risk reward opportunities. But before I digress even further, let's jump into the market barometer and look at the historical relationship between stocks and bond prices. 
So in the top chart, we have the SPY ETF. Once again, that's gonna be our proxy for the stock market. And in the lower chart here, we have TLT. Once again, our proxy for bond prices. And looking at the correlation coefficient, we see that you know the relationship between these two asset classes uh, ebbs and flows and typically isn't very statistically significant with a correlation coefficient generally oscillating between 0.5 and negative 0.5. We're looking at a long-term chart here going back to, you know, 2004 or so. And you can see that, you know, it does flip-flop back and forth between positive and negative correlation. And it usually spends most of the time on one side or the other for a significant amount of time. But again, the strength of that relationship is not very statistically significant. What is significant about this relationship is that in the short term, bonds tend to lead stocks. Now, the best explanation that I can give you as to why that is, is generally because the bond market is dominated by more sophisticated institutional investors that have access to more efficient data quicker. So they're able to incorporate new information much more efficiently than individual investors in the stock market may be able to. So when I see bond prices change direction and start to form a divergence from the stock market, it clues me into the fact that there may be a major inflection point coming. And the longer that divergence plays out, the more dramatic that inflection point is likely to be. Before we wrap up, there's one more tool I'd like to show you guys here in the market barometer. This is the intermarket analysis tab of the macro section of the software. It's gonna give you a quick overview of the relative performance of stocks bonds, commodities, and the dollar. And it's gonna give you the percentage gain or loss over a given time frame. And this is completely adjustable. So if you wanna take a quick look at how these assets have performed relative to each other over given time frames, this is a really quick, easy solution to have a better understanding of what's going on with these relationships. There you go, folks. A quick look at the basics of intermarket analysis. We started to scratch the surface by considering the relationship relationships between the four major asset classes, those being stocks, bonds, commodities, and currencies, and how each of those asset classes interact and influence one another. Be advised that there are a ton of different relationships in the market, some of which are very valuable to track and monitor. So we've really only scratched the surface today. So stay tuned for our weekly macro overview videos where we'll be diving into more of these relationships as they become relevant. And also, I'm hoping that you can utilize the tools and techniques that we use in our analysis today as you begin to understand and evaluate the important relationships in the market. I'm hoping that after watching this video, you understand how how important the central relationships driving the markets really are and that having an understanding of them is going to help you to create your own narrative as to the macroeconomic environment and in turn be able to more effectively manage and maneuver a portfolio of assets. So stick around for the rest of this video series as we dive deeper into developing our understanding of the macroeconomic environment and how we can use that to become smarter, more informed, higher probability investors and traders. For now, I'm your host, Neil. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel, hit that like button, leave any comments or questions down below. And thanks for tuning in. We'll see you guys in the next video.